Hey, everybody. Uh, while the rest of our congregation is now serving in all their ways with outside the walls, I wanted to share with you a, a message that I gave a few years ago that I think works well with the series that we've been doing called Don't Read the Bible. And so uh, this morning I want to read a scripture for you that uh, goes with this message. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 to 17. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from who you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Uh, I remember one time a, a small group leader in a church that I served came to me and said, you know, I had a little issue come up the other night in, in group uh, that one of the guys in the group said that he believed that the Bible taught reincarnation. And he quoted Matthew eleven fourteen, where Jesus says about his cousin John the Baptist, he is the Elijah who was to come. Like, there it is, proof in the Bible in, in, in reincarnation. So does that mean that John the Baptist was a reincarnation of Elijah? Well, I assured the group leader that that's not what Jesus is saying here. That's not what he's teaching here. Though if you are looking for evidence to support reincarnation, this would appear to fit. But saying that this is teaching about reincarnation is reading something into the text that isn't there. You know, there are a lot of ways to read the Bible. You know, from doing a quick online search, uh, you can find people who believe that Jesus was an Egyptian Freemason, and people who believe that Jesus was a Buddhist monk, and people who believe that he was an extraterrestrial from another planet. There are lots of ways to read the Bible, and some of them are wrong. And you know, we don't like to say that, do we? We don't like to tell anybody, oh, that's, that's, that's wrong. Uh, I mean, if, if somebody says, you know, I believe Jesus was a ghostbuster, you go, well, that's your interpretation, you know, what can I say? But what do we do with the Bible? Uh, you know, to some, the Bible feels like an old pickup that's been in the family for generations, and you know, we can't get it started anymore, and we're not really prepared to, to invest in it, but we don't really want to get rid of it either, so we just keep it in the garage and dust it off once in a while. This is the final Sunday in our series, Wrestling with the Book. The first week, we looked at how, the, how can the Bible and science be compatible. Last Sunday, uh, we addressed the question, aren't the Bible manuscripts full of copy errors? And by the way, you can uh, watch or listen to uh, any past uh, messages on our website or on our Faith Westwood app. Uh, today's topic is, can the Bible be read in a way that's authoritative? That's a big question. It's an important question, isn't it? Can the Bible be read in a way that is authoritative? Well, today I'm going to make a case that the answer is yes. The Bible can be read in a way that makes sense and is authoritative, and whether or not you agree with me, uh, what I'll be sharing today is consistent with what early Christians believed uh, and what they understood about biblical authority even before the full canon of the Bible was settled. It's con also consistent with the way the, the uh, Protestant reformers understood biblical authority. Uh, Martin Luther, John Calvin, John Wesley... The Bible's authority begins with God. God's authority comes to us in large part mediated by the Scriptures, through the Scriptures. And it comes to us, as we know, in two parts, the Old and the New Testament. And our relationship between, with the two is different. 
The Old Testament is a story of how God began working uh, through his chosen people in his redemptive plan to reclaim humanity and to restore creation. And then Jesus comes and he sees himself as the fulfillment of that Old Testament story. Let's open our Bibles now to that passage that Becky read for us, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to start with verse 14, which is in the middle of the paragraph. Um, and if you wish that you had a Bible at home to read of your own, then today we can make that happen. After worship, just head down uh, across the foyer to the, to, the, to the wall display called the Connection Center right next to the elevator, and you'll see a little rack there with Bibles. Just take one. It's yours. You can keep it, okay? Uh, now, this passage is, is, in the, is in the New Testament, and it's written to a young Christian about the value of the Hebrew Scriptures, what we call our Old Testament, yet it doesn't tell Timothy that he has to obey every commandment in the Old Testament. Did you, you'll notice that. Verses 14 and 15 say this, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and, be, and become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it. And how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So for Christians, here's the first part of our relationship with the Old Testament. The Old Testament points us to Jesus. Timothy grew up learning the Old Testament. That was his Bible. Uh, he knew the, the beginning of the story, and so then when he learned about Jesus, when he learned the gospel, he realized that all those scriptures he grew up learning were pointing to, to Jesus. So now let's go on to verses 16 and 17. It says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, God breathed means it's inspired. And that's really what the, the, the basics or the etymology of the word inspire means, is that to, to breathe life into. God has breathed life into the Scriptures. And then it talks about the second purpose of the Old Testament, that it is useful for teaching. And, of course, then it goes on to say rebuking, correcting, and training. But I'm kind of using teaching as a summary word there. Uh, in July, I gave a series, uh, four Sundays, from the book of Daniel. A lot of you were here for that. Uh, and as Christians, though, we read the book of Daniel, but we, we realize we're not expected to, um, you know, get down on our knees and, and face Jerusalem to say our prayers three times a day like Daniel did. And we're not expected to completely abstain from any kind of rich food like Daniel did. But we also know that the book of Daniel has good things to teach us, even from our perspectives as, as followers of Jesus. It is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness. And we can learn from that because we recognize that there is continuity between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And yet, there's also discontinuity. A lot of the Old Testament has been replaced by excuse me, a lot of the Old Testament has been replaced by the New Testament. For example, we are no longer bound by the, to the law of Moses because we are bound to something much higher, the ethics of Jesus. We no longer sacrifice animals to atone for our sins because Jesus gave himself on the cross as the atonement for all the sins of the world. And we no longer have a physical building as a temple because God has given us his Holy Spirit and we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So here's my big idea of the day. I hope you'll write it down, take it home, even bring it to your group and talk about it, okay? Uh, the Old Testament points to Jesus and is useful for teaching, but we want our beliefs and behaviors to be consistent with the New Testament. That's a lot to take in, isn't it? But think about it. Let's say it together, shall we? The Old Testament points to Jesus 
and is useful for teaching, but we want our beliefs and behaviors to be consistent with the New Testament. Now, we're going to come back to this statement uh, a couple of times here in the message, but I want to ask, well, how do we do that? What does that look like? How do we, how do we live consistently with the New Testament? Um, scholar N.T. Wright uh, says it'll help if we see the Bible as a play in five acts. Act 1, creation. Act 2, the fall into sin. Act 3, Israel. Act 4, Jesus. And Act 5, the church. Now, in Act 4, where do we get that? Well, we see that in the four biographies about Jesus at the beginning of the New Testament. Act 4 is the decisive turning point of the whole story. Jesus is the heart of the story. And Act 5 uh, then includes all the rest of the New Testament, and it continues today. We are still in Act 5. And Act 5 is about spreading God's good news of salvation through Jesus, and it's how God is building his kingdom in the world today. Put it back again. How do we do that? We take... What was written earlier in the play, especially the New Testament, Act 4 and the beginning of Act 5, and we say, okay, I'm going to base my life on this story. I'm going to live as best I can creatively and consistently with the New Testament. That's how we read the Bible authoritatively. For example, uh, when it says in the, in the letter to the Ephesians, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for bringing others up. I mean, I look at that and I go, okay, that's what I got to do. You know, uh, and, uh, and it doesn't really say what unwholesome talk is. I guess I kind of have to figure that out for myself. I have to pray about it. I have to, you know, read other scripture. And, and then I also realize that there are times when I kind of let unwholesome talk, what I would consider unwholesome talk, come out of my mouth. And so I got to say, okay, Lord, I messed up. What I said wasn't helpful for building this person up. It probably tore him down. So I received forgiveness and I say, God, I need you to help me do better. Have, pick better words next time. When, when, I, when I read Jesus tell his disciples, you cannot serve both God and money, I think no, he's talking just to me, okay? Uh, Jesus, he, he, he leads me to examine my lifestyle and say, okay, how, do, how am I treating money? Is, I, is it all for me? Is, is it about what I want and my needs? Is it what's God leading me to do? How am I supposed to respond with my giving? And so these are the, the kind of things that I go through as I'm trying to live creatively and consistently within the story. And I realize that I am not free to come up with my own story, with, my, with a story that is, you know, maybe easier for me to live with. And so uh, when I think about how do we live within that story, and, and, and we can be, we're, we're, we do it a little differently than it was in the New Testament, we, we try to stay consistent with it. And that's why I had Jill and David share that little uh, theme and variations on chopsticks. <laughs>
Thank you. Yeah, the, the New Testament is like the chopsticks, okay? That's the basic. We, we know that tune. Even if you've never played piano in your, in your life, some of you have played chopsticks. You know it. And yet, what they shared with us was, consi- was a lot more than chopsticks, wasn't it? But it was consistent with chopsticks. You could still hear chopsticks going on that whole time with all of that other music surrounding it. Our variations have to uh, blend within the harmonies and the rhythms of the original tune. We cannot violate the original. Now, obviously, we're not talking that this is easy to do, right? I mean, setting our beliefs and behaviors so that they're consistent with the New Testament... I mean, that, that's, that's a lifelong journey. And, and it means that we have to, and it, what we have to do sometimes as we're reading a passage is um, try to understand what this passage originally meant. Not what, just what it, well, it means to me. We, that, I mean, that's, so, that's kind of a shortcut. We have to first understand what did it originally mean for the writer and the, and the first readers. We have to understand it in its context of the verses around it and within the historical context it was written in. For example, Jesus uh, said that if your right eye causes you to stumble into sin, then just gouge it out and throw it away. Well, I think it's safe to say that Jesus was speaking hyperbolically. (laughs) We hope so, right? Uh, Which means that he was exaggerating to make a point. Uh, And we know that because when we read the rest of the the New Testament, we we see that Jesus' followers were very serious about living a holy life, but they were not in the habit of gouging out their eyes. And as we read the New Testament, we have to decide if a passage is culturally specific or universal. For example, in 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul tells women that uh, they have to cover their heads when they pray or prophesy in worship. Well, some Amish and Mennonite groups see this as a universal command. They've got to have, the women have to have their head covered. But most Christians see this as culturally based instruction. Now, in our Western culture, uh, it's not, it's uh, nothing, there's nothing shameful about a woman having her head uncovered in public. And, uh, but if we were a church in the Middle East, this instruction might seem very appropriate to us. And once we start to understand what a New Testament passage meant in its, in its um, original context, uh, and whether it was culturally specific or universal, then... Then we are ready, as Jesus' people, to say, okay, how can I allow this to set the standard for how I believe and behave? And that's the process we go through when we read the Bible authoritatively. Now, I might might love the Bible. I might read the Bible. I might even quote the Bible. But the Bible only becomes authoritative when I let it change the way I think and the way I live. Wouldn't that make sense? The Bible only becomes authoritative when I let it, properly understood, change the way I think and the way I live. What about you? Do you let the Bible change the way you think and the way you live? I'd like to share a couple of examples that what that might look like. Here's one of them. It's a question, are Jesus' people expected to honor Sunday as the Christian Sabbath? What do you think? Because if we are, we've got some serious lifestyle changes to make, right? Okay. Uh, Have any of you seen the movie Chariots of Fire? Oh, you got to watch it. Matter of fact, I I had kind of thought of it during this week, and so I watched it. Trish and I watched it last night again, and it's it's uh, part of the story is about the 1924 Olympics, 
And this Scottish runner, Eric Little, uh, he was a devout Christian, and he refused to run the 100-meter heats because they were scheduled for Sunday. That was his conviction. He stood by his conviction. You've got to admire him for that. He saw Sunday as a Sabbath, and he was obligated to keep it holy. Now, Sabbath plays a huge role in the first three acts of the Bible story. God creates the heavens and the earth and, and rests on the seventh day. That's in Act 1. And then uh, God gave the Israel the Ten Commandments, and ke keeping the Sabbath day holy is one of the big ten. That's in Act 3. But remember what we said before. The Old Testament points us to Jesus and is useful for teaching, but we want our beliefs and behaviors to be consistent with the New Testament. Did you know that the New Testament reaffirms nine of the Ten Commandments, but not the Sabbath. Did you know that? Jesus was always getting in trouble for healing people on the Sabbath. And, and Jesus announced that a new day had come, the arrival of God's kingdom, and the former Sabbath days had been an important signpost pointing to this new day. But now, instead of having the Sabbath, we have Jesus. The New Testament says that He is our Sabbath rest. It's in the book of Hebrews. You know, I could point to a number of passages, but here's one. Uh, Paul tells the mostly Gentile Christians in Colossae not to let anybody judge them because they don't do all the Jewish stuff. Here's what it says. Do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival or a new moon celebration or a what? Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. And say the rest with me. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Jesus was raised on the first day of the week. We know that, on Sunday. And that's why the New Testament believers gathered on the first day, the Lord's Day. And yet nowhere in the New Testament does it transfer the Old Testament Sabbath requirements to Sunday. It's not in there. Now, now every day is infused with Sabbath, ce Sabbath celebration. For some of you, this is just like pew, blowing your mind. Of course, we recognize that, that life has to be made up of cycles of work and rest. We all need rest. A day in seven sounds awfully good, doesn't it? N.T. Wright suggests that Sundays uh, for Christians can be known maybe even more for what we do than what we don't do. It might be time to visit a jail or a hospice. Uh, it might be time to see an elderly neighbor or support a foster family. Here's another question. What does the Bible teach about polygamy? And how churches today should respond to polygamous families. Um, did you know that 40% of United Methodists live in Africa? And that's, that's kind of incredible, isn't it? 40% of United Methodists live in Africa. And in many of those countries, polygamy is legal. Now, because it's not legal here... Uh, maybe that will make this question easier to approach. Maybe not quite as emotional as some other topics. But, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if someday polygamy were legal in the United States. Could be. Now, at the beginning of the Bible, Adam and Eve were monogamous, right? I mean, who else did they have, <laughs> you know? Uh, but we find another, uh, a number of polygamists in the Old Testament, Abraham, the father of faith, was married to Sarah, and then he took a second wife, Hagar. Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, so, I mean, that's a pretty important guy. He had two wives and two concubines, who, which, which is kind of a lesser status wife. 
Uh, King David had lots of wives and concubines, as kings often did. And then his son, King Solomon, uh, outdid his dad with a thousand wives and concubines. Now, a polygamist today could point to, to these uh, people in the Old Testament and say, See, I've got a biblical marriage. But that's not how we Christians understand the authority of Scripture. Remember what we said. The Old Testament points us to Jesus and is useful for teaching, but we want our beliefs and behaviors to be consistent with the New Testament. It's worth noting that while none of these men in the Old Testament uh, are condemned for their polygamy, in nearly every case, polygamy leads to problems. You, you, you know, go, as, you, as you're scanning through the Old Testament, kind of note that sometime. Now, by the time of Jesus, most Jews practiced monogamy. And Jesus affirmed monogamy uh, by pointing to creation. In Genesis 2, a man leaves his father and mother and becomes united with his wife. Now, a couple of centuries or so after Jesus, uh, most, excuse me, a couple of decades or so after Jesus, most Christians came from Gentile backgrounds where polygamy was sometimes practiced. Um, yet they were not expected to divorce all but one of their wives. I mean, that would, that would be really that would be making their other wives destitute and their children, and that just didn't seem like the solution at all. Uh, they could remain polygamous, but monogamy was taught and expected for next-generation Christians. And that's how they handle it in our churches in Africa today. When a polyg polygamous family becomes a Christian, divorce is not recommended. Still, our churches and our pastors do not perform weddings for someone who is already married. And in the New Testament, uh, office holders in the church, uh, bishops, elders, deacons, were required to be either celibate or monogamous, and, and, and our churches in Africa live by that consistently within that New Testament model. Now, what I've shared with you today is the classic approach, I believe, for Christians who believe, who read the Bible authoritatively. That doesn't make us fundamentalists, but we do live within God's story. And we know that someday Jesus is going to come and he's going to begin God's new story with the renewed heaven and the renewed earth. And it's going to be a great story. So today I want to end with two questions for you, okay? Will you read the Old Testament and let it point you to Jesus and let it be useful for teaching? Will you read the Old Testament? Let it, let it point you to Jesus. Let it be useful for teaching. And will you read the New Testament, shaping your beliefs and behaviors to be consistent with it? Let's pray. Oh, Lord God, we thank you for this book that has been passed down through the generations to us, this revelation, this, uh, this great epic saga, this story of your redemption. And Lord God, we pray that you will make us, like John Wesley said, people of the book, people of one book, Lord, we want to search its scriptures with, with wisdom. We want to understand how others have, under, others have understood it before us. We want to read it together in our groups and in our families.
And Lord, we ask that you will shape us, shape our lives according to your word. We pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen.